the Appalachians project, man. So, I mean, this is something that you hold near and dear. And I know several other people that are tied to it, but really you talked about this um, at an earlier uh, Future Cannabis project uh, video in a basement in Venice, in an old speakeasy of all places with some very interesting folks. So tell us a little bit about that, because that's really what put things on the map. Right? Yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, nice pun. <laughs> so, Pardon the pun, yeah. 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 <laughs> so we, um, so the founder of the Mendocino Appalachians Project, one of the things that we did with the, with the Appalachians was, you know, I come from a design background, and I had been building greenhouses. I mean, I've been in the, the California industry for about 22 years. Um, so I'm like, very familiar with Northern California and the cannabis trade. Um, I understood what was going on from a political standpoint because of course, you know, I was on the other side of the gate. Um, and then I was on the Food Policy Council. So I was working um, a lot with policy around food, you know, uh, policy development, you know, for food. And also writing um, online software programs for you know virtual food hubs for distribution, decentralizing production, farm to table dinner series for about ten years. So I had this idea of small batch craft and how to how to support taking cannabis money and supporting the local food system. Um, and then I got arrested in 2012 and yeah, ended up um, very publicly exposed for my work in the nonprofit sector. And um, and I had a choice: either apologize for being in the cannabis industry, which had supported all this great work to that point, or step up and do something. Um, got into policy uh, council development, uh, developed the Mendocino Policy Council uh, with a few other Mendocino kind of cannabis policy council with a with a you know few other people, and then. Um, my skill set was really in that design so it was like I was noticing where I really get in where you fit in and I started drawing this map I started drawing an Appalachians map I'd heard the concept of Appalachians of the wine regions of France grew up with them I was like super stoked on, on you know on how they had developed um, what it seems protections for small batch and craft um, wine producers yeah, yeah. you know and very similar and, and right very similar pr- both pr- pr- yeah, pr- protecting well. products of place essentially yeah. protecting IP because when you give the farmer IP you give them the power not the corporations correct so the market then demands back to the IP which is connected to the land and the land owners versus the corporation and the product so it's products of place and of place being the the number one determinant so drawing that map really was cementing our regional heritage and legacy moving forward and then drove around with the map i don't know if you saw the map today but you know with the pins I saw, in it yeah, i've seen it before, so that's yeah. a state map so this is our first shot at doing a state map because you guys are down in my neck of the woods yeah, i think yeah. you're out in the desert aren't yeah, you? no no, no 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 we're, we're <laughs> launching we we do um we, we do mapping, so we're yeah. identifying regions where cannabis yep. is being produced in geographical indication settings, not necessarily for appellation of origin. Gotcha. So the expression, the metabolomic expression of the plant, its relationship with sun and soil is the most important thing. So therefore, desert is not really a place where you can do that. You have to do it engineered or inside, and that's yeah. you don't get an appellation. Gotcha. So, but anyway, it, you know, it, it was a really good way to protect small batch and craft cannabis producers. It was a real way to protect the legacy and heritage of the region, and a real way to you know dif- make a quality uh, differentiation in the marketplace. And um, and yeah. so, which we hope to see forward with organizations like Emerald Exchange and 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 craft cannabis producers everywhere. So how did that that affected a bit of the policy here in the state of California, right? Because I know there's certain brands like Humble. We'll pick on one that had to segue their name into Dosis to go through that because of the Appalachians. I mean, just as an example. Yeah, I mean, so you can't claim the name of a place necessarily as the brand name. Yes. You know, and a lot of people are going to start to see that when Appalachian petitions start to come in. Yep. There's going to be this huge backlash against all the brands that have the name of either the Humble, strain. Eureka, yeah. Trinity, well, and, it, and a lot of it comes down to the strain names as well, yeah. you know, so it's like Big Sur Holy Bud is an example that Richard Mendelson brought up the other day. Um, you know, that's that's really big. So like Big Sur Holy Bud, we just call it Holy Bud grown in Big Sur, California. Yeah. And, or Big Sur Appalachian. Giving the power back to the Appalachian, not the strain. Because if you get it to the strain, they, they could grow it in Ethiopia and have Big Sur Holy Bride grown all around the world. And it doesn't necessarily maintain that same marker of quality that it comes from that specific region. So Holy Bud grown in Big Sur then becomes the marker of quality. Makes sense. So yeah. so getting into this, and you, I, you know, we hate to compare this industry to the alcohol industry, but it's kind of hard not to. 
And it's one of those things where, kind of talking about micro and macro, we have, and again, literally a metaphor, like Celestial Brands, Anheuser-Busch, we know Miller Coors has been focused on it for a minute. So I'll ask both of you, but start with you, Ricardo, because some of this is in your backyard. I mean, Miller Coors is right down the street from you in Golden, Colorado, right? Sure, sure. So what do you think of as some of these mainstream alcohol and even more recently, obviously, tobacco companies, where do you see us in a year as far as the larger corporations versus the smaller micro, if you will, versus macro? I think this is only the beginning, and apparently that guy agrees. <laughs> Uh, but no, this is only the beginning, right? Yeah. I mean, we're just seeing the first giant alcohol brand, uh, the first few big beer brands. Of course, now Altria, the owner of Fi yeah. uh, Philip Morris International, is is in the game with a very legitimate, uh, almost one point eight billion, I think. It yeah, was, one point right? eight billion dollar <laughs> investment in in Kronos up in Canada. Yeah, we're going to see a lot more of this. Yeah. Um, I think it was 45%. Oh, well, oh that's with right. With potential right. for 55. For potential. Yeah, totally. Was, but, yep. but yeah, no, the, it, it, it's, it's, only, it's only amplifying. We're going to see so much more of this, and I think it's inevitable. And I think the only thing we need to be aware of is uh, most of these industries have not been the most accountable, um, have not been the most transparent or honest, and we 100%. just need to be uh, conscientious about what their involvement could mean for the potential future of this industry and the businesses they're involved with because you could watch Mad Men, you could uh, watch another number of documentaries and, and read books, but but uh, yeah, especially big tobacco. And, and, and of course, let's not forget pharmaceutical because the largest donor to the opposition campaign and in the uh, 2016 election in Arizona yep. was Insys Therapeutics. Proud I Arizona. Back to bite him a bit, huh? That was an interesting story, I think. Oh God, <laughs> I know, maker of a crazy strong and deadly uh, fentanyl. But I, I think we need to just keep an extra close eye on these entities. Uh, you know, whether it's pharma, alcohol, nicotine, to make sure that they're not practicing the ill deeds of their past now. Right. Definitely. Makes sense. And what's your take? I mean, this is we know you, you've grown up not too far from where I grew up up here. And we've seen it with like the micro brews, right? I mean, very few, we try to keep these micro brews from jumping the shark, so to speak, and going to A, B, and becoming just in our name, like Goose Island or Breckenridge Brewery in Colorado. So how do you see that playing out in NorCal? Has it been true that companies like in the nicotine space have been purchasing property up here it, north of it, San Francisco? You know, you never know. That's the thing. Right. It, it, you never know until you do. And then all of a sudden it's like, you get into common sense, right? It's like, who the hell would want to move to Northern California and produce 10,000 square feet of craft cannabis yeah. when they can go down into Imperial Valley, Central Valley, Coachella they can Valley. go down to Coachella yeah. Valley, they can go down to you know Salinas, they can go to Carpinteria, they can go to San Luis Obispo, and they can grow a million square feet of really beautiful cannabis that they can put into packaging and sell for a premium in the in the consumer marketplace like Los Angeles, San Diego, Sacramento at, at, at literally, you know, pennies a gram. You know, you're looking at some of these new productions, five cents a gram. At scale, right, let's just say at 10 cents a gram, we're at $45 a pound, right? Five cents a gram, we're at 22.50 a pound. So we would have to grow tens of thousands of pounds yeah. here just to support the taxes and the mortgage on our farms. So the idea that we would ever survive as a commodities uh, competitor, it doesn't even make sense. So we're extremely hopeful and optimistic because at the end of the day we have projects, we have media projects telling the story of who did carry this torch for this number of years, right? So it's like, I've got 22 years of shipping out of, out of you know, Northern California you know, five you know five decades of production. I mean, it's a legacy and a heritage that carried the torch for everyone. Now, if, if industry comes in and decides that they want to homogenize an entire region, right? That it'd be kind of an asshole move, right? So and and it doesn't make very much sense. It seems spiteful. UCBA just tried to do something very similar to the retail space, where they're saying like, "Well, we're gonna." We're, we're going to block events and we're going to block small batch craft cultivators from having direct access to consumers. Yes. And, yeah. and, and, you know, not because they had to, but because they could. 
yep. you know, not because it made sense, but just because they were kind of pulling the little jerk move. And, and that's okay, you know, we see people doing that all the time. But the one thing they can't have is Northern California. Yeah. The one thing they can't have is our redwoods, they can't have our land, right? They can't have the millions of people that come up here to visit our coastlines. They can't have all of these things that we already have intrins intrinsically linked to our, to, you know, to our survival already, which is tourism dollars, yeah. right? So we have an industry. Now we just have to say, I was lucky that I got to take that yoga class, yeah. you know, for 10 years. I was lucky that I got to coach soccer for those years. I was lucky that I got to, to do all those things. It was a blessing. It was a gift that the medicine gave to yeah. me. Super great. Now I got to pick up the hammer and the saw again. I got to learn how to build a glamping 100%. tent. You know? <laughs> exactly. I've got, to, I've got to, you know, I've got to go down to the thrift store. I got to Venice Beach out my little glamping tent and charge $200 a night and give them a joint. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, that's what, that's what we do. And yeah. we just have to wait. We have to stop crying. We have to stop scaling because if we scale up to 10,000 square feet, we're taking all of our good resources and dumping it into a failing market, yeah. which is the commodity space. We are not commodities farmers. I can produce 10,000 square feet of crap, right? And yet, but you're not going to get top but, dollar. But, but, yeah. but, and, yeah. Or I could produce you know, 2,500 square feet of the finest cannabis on the planet. And people will pay for that. And That's people will play for that. The premium yeah. is good. So we just need to just go back to what it was that we were doing before. Yeah. You know, we're homesteaders now. A lot of us moved up here as economic so, refugees. Yeah. So now we've learned how to farm. We've learned how to build. We've learned how to survive. We've learned how to pump our own water. We've learned how to do all these great things. Now we just get to share those gifts and skills with the rest of the world. Yeah. And the world is going to change. You know. I think it is. You're right. And, and we had Kevin Jodry, a mutual friend of both of ours, had Kevin Jodry on. And, you know, some of the things that he's doing specifically in Humble. I mean, it has that, that name has such a reputation internationally, as does Mendocino. But Humble definitely does. And that's what we talked about. Like some of that, you know, we've got to bring this money in, got to bring the right money in, the positive money in. And tourism is where it's at because this is still an epicenter. I mean, traveling to places like, you know, Spain for, for uh, Spanibus or traveling, just getting back from Canifest to Prague. I mean, there's people, they know these names. They're synonymous with top quality fire. Not to say a good genetics don't exist in Europe too, but Northern California definitely has that image that should be Well, taken, well it also, you know. also is gonna be the capital of regenerative farming across the world because at the end of the day, we were behind locked gates and we, we became permaculturalists. Oh yeah. By, also by necessity. Yep. We shared by necessity. We communicated and became community by necessity. We were geographically isolated. We can teach yeah. the world these values and these skills in an institute style, retreat style basis. We can bring people up and teach them to be permaculturalists, right? Yep. And we can show them living systems that we've been building over decades as well. Oh, I love we're seeing the, the closed loop farmers yeah, yeah, up there. It's yeah. a good example. These guys from aquaponics to film, I mean, composting, annualized, I mean, it's. It's it's really cool indigenous inocul inoculants, microbiome, in yeah. ground soil. Like I mean, we we do it. Yeah. So we do polyculture for real. And it's you funny know? you mentioned homesteaders because that's one thing, Kevin. I mean, this guy is so great. If if you guys know Huel, you grew up probably with Huel Hauser, right? With California Gold. I compare Kevin to Huel Hauser because this guy moved from Tennessee, but he knows more probably about California, specifically north of San Francisco, than most natives that I grew up with. And here, this guy is just so he preaches it so well. But the education that he shares as far as what's going on and the fact that the largest acreage of privately held property by far is in that county of this entire state. I think it says a lot about the whole neighbors and how you all coexist and, and make things happen and do it as a collaborative, right? Do it as a team effort more more so now than ever. So what do you feel about, you know, we had um, we had a, a Mendocino, uh, um, I want to say Mendocino Generations on earlier that we were talking to. So is a project like that something that's making a difference to your point as far as taking care of the smaller growers? Well, I mean, so Mendocino Generations is positioned on Greenfields Ranch, which is the oldest intentional community in Mendocino County. So back to the landers in the 1960s came back, planted cannabis. You're seeing Mendocino Generations are the second and third generation farmers from that original group of, of back to the landers from San right? Francisco. Yeah, 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 right? And it's hilarious. I mean, I've, I've stayed and hung out in, um, you know, you know, in 
in Greenfields for a while. I used to watch sunsets on at Steve Riles' property before he passed on the top of the hill, and you know, and, and watch his big twenty-five, you know, monster, you know, ten pounders, and you know, and, and, the, and yeah. the, you know, and and um, I rented a property across the street in, in Running Springs for a little while, and nice. and got to know a lot of these guys, and got to know a lot of these people in the Mendocino generations, and they're it's it's a really unique model. A lot of them are micro branding. Right, but then they're still putting it into the common pot to, yeah. to then support yeah. Arcana, which is their flower support brand. Support the marketing exactly. efforts. Exactly. So, I mean, it's so, a really cool so it's so it's so it's really cool. It's kind of get that like sort of like Thundercats Transformers yeah. model, where like they all come together <laughs> and make this together. super thing, <laughs> and then they can all split apart and become this micro thing. Yeah. And um, I've been running farmers markets in Mendocino County for five years now. Um, we would rent out of a hall, and we would do it below ground, and yeah. you know, at underground farmers markets. And uh, our original farmers that would come down from the hills were coming down from Comshi and, and Greenfields. Chia was one of the original farmers, and she was one of the original brands as well, Madrone, um, you know, Arcana, Mendocino Generation, yep. some now Blazing Oaks, is working with those guys. Like, So you're getting a lot of these farmers that are coming in, three, uh, three Sisters, you know, yeah. a lot of these brands that are able to be their own farmer's market booth at a booth space and then when we come to a larger space come together and all be that come together right? it's like and, and that's a cooperative model yep. that's necessary in all industries that's another nice. thing that we can teach people is how to act like like an organism like actually yeah. act like humans right that live in community and coexist, yeah, and, coexist yeah. and move that model into economy right and start creating economies of scale that aren't necessarily scaled large yeah. but they're replicably small yeah. and scalable and that's what and that's what we yeah. see with Arcana, and it's an actual working model, yeah. and and being agile and adaptive like that is going to allow them to survive. Because what Darwin adapt and survive, right? So, yeah. and so. we are doing that model, and it's, it's funny you mentioned we just had uh, this kind of became a bit of an international show, and we'll get into like the the vibe on the show from you. I want to hear from both of you, because Justin, it's not your first radio, Ricardo, it is. So I can't wait mm -hmm. to talk on that as well for this specific event. But we just had some of our friends from uh, Santiago, Chile, that came up, and they just did that at Expo We. They're like, hey, Lance, we want to get you and, and these five other brands together and do it as a collaborative. And I was like, 100%. Makes total sense. They were all brands that complemented each other. We all had similar messaging and mantras. Rick, you and I were just talking about this a minute ago. The culture matters in a company, and we want to align ourselves with other companies that have that similar, similar culture and ethic, and that's exactly what this was. So you all came, and yeah, it was a cost savings, as this, as that, but the fact that we had that continuity and we we're all able to coexist, I mean, that's again, I agree, it should be a more than just we grow flower and grow great buds, so. It can be meaningful, but uh, I mean, also, it's, it's, it's the things that we can teach one another, right? But it's also things that we should just be learning from other industries. So we shouldn't be teaching. It's like, you no, know, you go to consumer packaged goods and you look what's happening there. Yeah. It, because almost all of that will be applicable in the cannabis industry of the future, even if it's not that, that way yet. Exactly. Exactly. So the segue. Oh. But then we ask the question. This is the question. Is it right? Right. Should we be learning from extractive industries that have destroyed the planet? Or should we be teaching regenerative systems to industries and getting into the policy? See, that's the thing is we now have grassroots policy advocates that are getting in and changing laws. And so we can change packaging laws. Because you know what, at the end of the day, it was our survival on the line of whether or not we were packaging or not packaging. And this, I mean, I've watched brands package for six months, spend all of their money, and then the BCC changes packaging. You know, Yep. And, and we as small batch cultivators can't afford a twenty, thirty thousand dollars packaging hit. Yeah. It, so we get back in and we advocate and we write and we become participatory democracy. We can teach industry that we don't have to roll over for policy. We can change policy to change industry to become less extractive to the whole. And that's something that cannabis is going to teach people. It's a teacher, it's a plant spirit, right? So it's taught mm -hmm. us for all these decades how to act right to the earth, how to honor the earth. And now that we're moving into industry, now we have to act right and industry needs to follow suit because at the end of the day, the Paris Climate Accord and what happened with Donald Trump and what's happening around the world, it's, it's an up, it's an, a cry. It's a rallying cry for humans to start acting in a way that's in accordance with their mother or get kicked out. Yeah. Like, like we're, we're out. So we have to change. And I think cannabis on a larger sense is like telling us like, please change these other industries, please. Mm -hmm. For the love of all things holy. Yeah. Well, and, and I, God, man, I, I hope you're right, and I wish you were right. I think 
it comes down to how we treat the plant and how we treat our resources, absolutely. But it also comes down to how we treat our human capital. And, you know, I think we all hoped that this industry could be different than any other industry, right? 100%. And, and we saw early numbers, like let's just talk about how we, you know, we're three dudes up here. How do we treat our, our, our women partners in this mix? Um, and, and, and they deserve more because what is the average number of women in CEO or ownership positions in traditional industries? It's in the 20%. Oh, and we, and we were the highest percentage of female, to your point, in this industry. We were, I, I don't know we were if it's up still, there. No, yeah. and, and it, it has declined there. every yeah. year of the last three to four years. Yeah. And so I want cannabis to be better. I want to believe that we can be. But right now we're just proving to be to just fulfill yeah, this kind of yeah. inevitably sad, uh, uh, pathetic um, destiny of being yet another uh, industry controlled by the patriarchy. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and to that point, I will tell you that you know it is empowering as a as a white male in this industry to hand that over. We had Jessica Cure our, as our CEO oh, yeah. for a number for for she a rocks. year and a half. <laughs> Fucking amazing. Yeah. As soon as she left, like I asked Michael's girlfriend, I was like, Teresa, will you please be our CEO? Like, because yeah. <laughs> we need that female leadership because cannabis sativa L you know, it's yep. feminized now, like, and the seedless cannabis is what we're smoking. It's a female, it's a goddess, it's what we're, so like, needs to be female run. Yeah. And executive director of MAP, Janine Coleman, she cranks out like 30 emails before breakfast. She's amazing, <laughs> she's a workhorse. That's the type of leadership that we need. Even because Hazel they, here, which is Hazel a good Bagwell you know, Hazel, is amazing. I mean, she's yeah. a rock star, yeah. man. Taylor like, Blake, yeah. Taylor, Taylor Blake. You know, yes. I, 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 I was in on this with, the, you know, watching Taylor run yeah, this for Tim. She's next generation. She's next, she's first generation. <laughs> yeah. Like, she, like, yeah. Tim started, but Taylor yeah. took it. You Just know, out and, his and, 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 yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, well, it, yeah, so it was Desmond's birthday. Yeah. It was Desmond's birthday. Yeah. And, and it was Desmond's yeah. birthday. And then it became, and then, and, and, and then, you know, and then it became the judge. But anyway, but yeah, so, but, but, but to say, it is. I see that. It's so great the way the she wants to be handed off to the female, and how yeah. the females are acting so well in the space. And it is a. It, it's teaching me. I mean, at least I'm learning. So yeah. if anybody else doesn't learn, at least at least, at least I'm learning it. <laughs> that's a good transition because that's exactly the last question I had. And again, we we kind of talked about off camera, but Ricardo came up, and I think you know, being from Northern California, and, and you know, obviously having your pass as well. So this is your first cup. Yes. So congratulations. This Thank is not, you. he has been around the block for years, je, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and very much an advocate <laughs> for the industry, a, a medicinal, a medical advocate like myself. But this is your first Emerald Cup. This kind of cool. So what do you think? It is my first Emerald Cup. Thank you for the welcome. God, I, I, I will say that this vibe is special. I, you have to come here to get it. I get it now. It's, yeah. it's, it's special. It is, it is an expo. It is a trade show but it's infused with this spirit and, and, and more than anything, even though, you know, of course there's the booths like yeah. this one that yeah. we'd expect, <laughs> but <clears throat> it still feels like it's a celebration of sun-grown cannabis, which I think is what Tim started as originally all those years yeah. ago in Leightonville. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I feel very warmly welcome. It's good to see you, my friend. Yeah. It's great yeah, to meet, exactly. meet, meet you. Exactly. And, and um, I, I can definitely say that I will be back. Awesome. We'd love to have you back. And maybe we'll do a little little tour here or there next time you come up. We have a couple of friends just up the road. Love to show you what they have going on. And then you, we, we've discussed this before, and that, Mike knows that's why I've been a supporter of Emerald Exchange since the beginning. But you, in my opinion, living in Southern California and going to an Emerald, Ex Emerald Exchange, this is exactly what I compare it to. Just bringing down that culture and that NorCal vibe. It's, and you've heard about this, Rick. You know, NorCal, SoCal, we, either you claim one or the other. It's funny. If you're from here, it's like, you know, and I'm NorCal, everyone knows, I hate LA. I'm not a fan, it's just not my, the pretentious, the whole. So when I went to my first, I am so not a fan of LA, man. I had to, I do. San Francisco, in my opinion, is the best city in the country, not even the state, but it's it's efficient. You look at LA, nobody drives in LA, that, or nobody walks in oh, LA, yeah. that, that's a uh, real song. As definitions, everyone has to drive compared to here where you have to rent a car if you're going to the city. You've got six different means of mass transit, but I digress. But you, you captured this. That's exa So Rick saw it. Like, this is what's cool. Is he's seen it this first year. 
you captured the energy of NorCal with 50, 60 small, medium-sized growers, and you brought them down to, of all places, the Santa Monica Mountains. Like, we're talking a few miles from the Malibu finest and the richest hoity-toity. Yeah. And how did you do that? Like, what, what, and how does that compare to what you've experienced over the years here? So I was doing the, the exchange in Northern California. So I was doing a farmer's market with an infused dinner at night, and I was, you know, you know, doing a banquet style table, all full farm to table, 100% local within the within the county. And then I was bringing out brands, right? Yep. Mostly it started with Mexican blankets and mason jars, right? And yep. then evolved into, of course, bringing in branded, you know, and, and your neighbor, right, you know, drawing a really cute logo and getting it printed at, at you know, at the, at the print shop. Some of them still look like so, that, some yeah, yeah. nostalgic. Yeah, so, so that's <laughs> happening. But um, I, you know, about two years throwing the event in uh, in, in the village of Mendocino, yeah. Yeah. and I went down to Malibu. I have a friend of mine who's um, uh, Jeremy from Sambazon. Yeah, you know, so we're down there, sanctuary yeah. on PCH, having a conversation, and one of our black market friends shows up, and he starts talking shit about Sundrum, <laughs> and I'm like, he's he's offering me like nine hundred dollars, and this is two and a half years ago. He's offering yeah. me nine hundred dollars for OG Sungrown pre-bought. And I told him that's bullshit, that he's going to buy it for 18 and love it, right? And that I asked Jeremy if there was a way that we could take the event that we were doing in Northern California and bring it down to SoCal yeah. onto his land, into Malibu. Yeah. And the, the, the thought was, is how do we link a culture, right? So it's like, do I bring a large group of humans from Northern California and, and put it in downtown LA, the large group of humans from Southern California, or do we take a small group of humans from, from you know, the village of Mendocino and from Mendocino County Hills and bring them to another medicine culture, a place where you'll find teepees in your yards and where there'll be a peyote ceremony possibly oh every other week. And yoga. You know, and yeah, yoga I mean, so and, and, yeah. and, and sound healing Kama Sutra. and yeah, you know, it was very all, cool. all of it. And, and so our culture meeting their culture. So it's two medicine cultures actually meeting. Yeah. So coming in and then, you know, creating this sort of, you know, it's not really a festival. It's more of like a no. wellness activation. So it's like crea it. cre creating activations, you know, instead of just booths, creating a bazaar and then having the brands actually have yurts and teepees and tents and airstreams yeah. and you know and separating it out and then bring in having something to do throughout the entire day yeah. but really what it is is it's that replicable small scalable model where we were saying yeah. we're going to take these small batch cultivators and go directly to influencers media businesses and and, and investors yeah. and say help us scale in a small way, in a place that can afford the margins that we need yeah. to, to and survive. you guys do that. You did a great job. That's one thing I remember and I was so impressed by. And I think Jessica was a bit of a force behind this as well. But coming from a digital media background like Rick, that you guys got a lot of coverage, a lot of organic coverage. Yeah. Put, that surprised me. It wasn't just well, niche pub per se, but well, it was mainstream. You want a, you want a secret? Huh. I'll give this one over. Um, so the original meeting for the Emerald Exchange, right, that where I met Michael Katz, yes. was actually my sister-in-law, Megan Champion, she hooked me up with Michael Katz and then Matthew from Foria and Brittany Comfer, Matthew's PR person. And we're all at a dinner hanging out and Matthew's very reserved. I don't know if you yeah. know Matthew well, yeah. but Matthew's very reserved. Thinks yeah. things are a good idea but he's, he's strategic and he's built a really great brand and a really good business model and he's great. But having him come in as a sponsor was a little bit iffy. So what he did was he gave us Brittany, his PR person. Oh, so his okay. sponsorship contribution was Brittany. And I did talk to her So before. all okay. of that national media and, and local bougie media that Foria was getting then became our media with the exchange. And I hired, uh, Louisa and Jeremy's wedding planner to come on and curate the original event. Oh, wow. So we had bougie media and a bougie Malibu wedding planner throw this event that was ended up being the perfect storm and they came out of the cover of the LA Weekly saying this farmer's market proves that weed is the new wine. And that was it. Like Fair as man. soon as yeah. that headline comes That's out, cool. it was like we we had, we'd 
and it was we gained the following. Vibe. Yeah, it was I amazing mean, like, vibes. You, you had a, a couple of Trustafarians, a couple of the, the hipsters come up from Malibu, a couple of those spoiled kids. But it's cool because like it, it was it was even just the guests. It was the people attending that kind of kept them in check. Like yeah. they they kind of came in with this LA attitude. And I remember people like they were sitting somewhere and kind of being rude to someone. They're like, No, we all share the table. Yeah, this yeah. is not your table, my table. This is our table. Yeah. And they're just like. Oh yeah, you're it's talking like, about the Malibu Gold guys yeah, and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and and the idea was, you know, is that we hand select and curate our attendees. We don't just broadcast it out. Yeah. We 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 our influencers then invite their friends that they want to see and meet the farmers. Yeah. So it's not like we're just, hey guys, want to come to an event? It's like, yeah, you know, a bit more than that. Hey, you, you know, you should really tell a couple of your close friends because we like you. Well, the next one you have. Maybe you and I can pitch up and get this guy to come out. Oh, yeah. Again, no, you need to come down. It's for once. Yeah. Party. And if he has an office out there now, he has an excuse to come visit. I have a guest room. Just saying. Nice. So, well, I want to thank both of you guys. I mean, this is, we're in the final hours. You can hear all the teardown noise in the background here. But I really, really sincerely appreciate you guys both taking the time, which was just us catching up as old friends in the hallway, taking the time to catch up with us here. So, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. All right. Get to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks, buddy.